We now go to the friction factor. I wonder why this used to have. Oh, we yeah. All right. Okay, here's problem 6.7 from your textbook. The Moody diagram. It's a classic. <clears throat> and this is one that you will see in heat transfer fluid mechanics and such. Okay. Okay, and and um, you'll see it, and it's it's age old. I saw it when I was a kid. You're going to see it if you're just sophomores. You know, it's your second year. You probably haven't gotten the heat transfer of fluids. Some of y'all are um, ahead, though, or behind, or whatever. However you look at it, and have had either fluids or heat transfer, and have seen this guy. Anyway, transactions at the ASME in 1944, and like I say here, in my little description. It's one of those rare graphics from the hundred years ago that has passed the test of time. Okay. Um, the Reynolds number is a dimensionless velocity. There's the mean, this is, the, this has to do with friction in a pipe, friction in a round pipe. The Reynolds number is the, the average velocity in the pipe diameter over its viscosity. Named after Osborne Reynolds. That's the old book, yes. The F is a friction called a friction factor. And it is basically the dimensionless pressure. It is the, basically the, the um, dimensionless pressure drop in the pipe. This term here, because you know pressure down, if you've got flow in a pipe, the pressure is the biggest at the inlet of the pipe and decreases as you go down the pipe. That's why the water is being, or air is being squeezed through the pipe, right? So there's the pressure drop that you might be interested in. And it's been normalized, put on a dimensionless form using the diameter and the mean kinetic energy. So it's multiplied by the di diameter divided by mean kinetic energy using the average velocity squared. Um, like this, the average kinetic energy. And therefore it's dimensional. So what can you do with this? And this and this this diagram is a function of surface roughness. See that little E is surface roughness, and E over D represents relative surface roughness. So 0 0.01 represents that the average surface roughness is one one hundredth of the pipe diameter, etc. So obviously the roughness tends to be a small fraction of the, you know, doesn't tend to be the most of the pipe. But uh, some very smooth pipes could be like this. A very, very rough pipe, the roughness is the roughness is stuff that could stick up, you know, 10, um, you know, one, two, three, five percent, five percent into the thing, very rough pipes. And what happens here with this friction factor is you get more friction, more pressure drop with rougher pipes. Okay. As, as seen in this diagram here, rough pipes, because it's all, it's harder, it's harder, it's more friction. It's harder to squeeze water through a pipe if it's very rough. You got a lot more turbulence, you got a lot more resistance along it through those little edges, through those little um, things right there, very difficult. So what can you do with this? And why would you have a graph like this? And why would you put it in dimensionless form? Well, first of all, let's say you can use it for any fluid. So let's say you, you, you don't recognize this and you, you want to do water. So you have a whole bunch of graphs for water at different conditions. But I want air. So you have a whole bunch of different graphs for air. And those are separate. And whole, you know, ethylene glycol and this, that, the other thing. And then under one, one velocity and the next velocity and da, da, da. So what you find yourself is an absolute library full of graphs, all the different fluids that would be of interest, all the different conditions. But all that data collapses, collapses into dimensionless form using the Reynolds number and this friction factor. This means, this means that, um, that this graph right here is, this, that means this graph right here is applicable to air, water, and oil. Or whatever. All the fluids. Well, you know the four. You know what the four, four fundamental fluids in, in in the universe are, right? At least if you, on, on the planet Earth, the four fundamental fluids are 
like you got the air, obviously, with the water, you need the water. In this day and age, you need the oil, the power industries, and of course, beer. Air, water, oil, and beer, the four fundamental fluids, okay? And of course, there's some people that would argue without, without our machines and our beer, without oil and beer, why, have, why bother with water and air? I don't even want to live without that stuff, right? So one could argue that oil and beer are the most important fluids on Earth. Of course, that would be kind of silly. Actually, if you, if you had, what is, what is beer most like? Let's, let's say you wanted to look up the properties of beer. What well, well hang, hang on, Professor. You're forgetting that there's an important fifth fluid, which is uh -oh. coffee. Coffee? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Coffee? Like this stuff here? Yes. And, and, and running my dang mouth so much, my coffee got cold. You're absolutely right. And another fluid that's actually important, my daughter and I agree with this. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you want to have a nice breakfast, milk. Oh my God, we woke up Saturday morning, there was no milk, it was horrible. I'm still scarred from it. Not quite as bad as going to a party with no beer. I know it's not, not quite that bad, but it was, it was pretty bad. The milk thing was pretty bad. But anyway, what can you do with this diagram? You can do lots of things. First of all, if you, and, but again, this is flow in a pipe. So if you're an engineer and you want to, um, you have a given pipe of a certain diameter D that's fixed and you have a certain pump. You have a certain pump in place and you know that pump delivers, you know that pump delivers a certain pressure gradient. What this will allow you to do with the friction factor is calculate flow rate because if the pressure is given, like you buy a pump, the specs on the pump are set, right? Like a little pump is little pressure gradient, and big pump is big one. What this allows you to do with this single diagram is to calculate the U, U mean squared or U mean, which gives you flow rate. So therefore, and you can do it whether that pipe is pumping water, air, or our beloved beer. It's a, a keg, you know, those kegs of parties. You know? So that's one thing you can do with it. Another thing you can do with it is if you, um, if you just have a certain flow rate that you desire, that is, I want, you know, the pipe is in place, D, two is in place in the density, say it's uh, oil, you know, the density. But you desire a certain flow rate of the oil through the pipe. This tells you what DP, DX you need and thereby tells you what size pump you have to buy, you see. Because pumps come in small, medium, large, and extra large, right? So this will tell you the pressure gradient you need and thereby you look up the manufacturer's specs and you decide, oh, I need this extra large pump or whatever, or this little, this little old pump will do the job. Because as an engineer at your company, you don't want to undersize things because you know you don't get the flow rate you want, but you don't want to overkill things because a huge overkill pump is typically more expensive. It's bigger, it's more clumsy, and you don't want to be a you know a bad a bad you know, bad boy or girl and get a huge pump that you don't need, wasting wasting um, the valuable resources of your company. That's not considered very good. So those are two of the main things you can do with this. Like I say, predict flow rate for the given pump or decide what pump you need for a given flow rate. And this is as a function of the Reynolds number. Now notice here, this is such a classic graph. And, and because it's in a beautiful normalized way, it applies to all the fluids. This is beauty. It applies to all diameter, all fluids and all diameters. See, because it's normalized. You don't have to have a separate pipe. You don't have to have a separate graph for each diameter and each fluid. They're all combined in this beautiful, one may be a little bit hard to understand at first, dimensionless graph here, okay? And, okay, anyway, another feature of this you see is that for slow flows, relatively slow, you can really think of this if you want as velocity, normalized by D, and let's, let's consider a fluid is set, that's viscosity, diameter set. So let's say the only thing that the Reynolds number changes with is velocity. For slow velocity, things are what's called laminar. These nice laminated layers, you know, organized layers. But as, the, if you, as you push the Reynolds up, up too high, 
these flutters, these, these turbulent flutters start to occur in the fluid and then it goes, and it goes completely turbulent. So they go through the small transition range, small transition range, where the fluid goes from um, nice laminated layers to this fully churning turbulent flow. And the higher, and the higher you push the Reynolds on, the more turbulent it is. And so that's a phenomenon in our natural world, the, the transition between laminar and turbulent flow. They say it occurs in, in a Reynolds number around 3,000-ish. See, there's the 2,500 in here. And it depends, it doesn't always happen exactly the same time because um, rough pipes would go turbulent quicker, smooth would be less. If, you, um, if your inlet flow is more disturbed, you know, there's just conditions, it's, it's one of those chaotic behaviors. But uh, around 3,000-ish on a typical pipe for typical roughness on a typical day, things will start going from laminar to turbulent. So you got all that to consider for this really important problem on, in fluid mechanics, flow in a pipe. Who cares about flowing a pipe? Well, lots of people. What, how do you have? I don't I think I need to justify applications for flow in a pipe. My God, it's everywhere, right? Um, so it's kind of a little bit complicated. There's the definitions of the things I've just been caught talking about right there. Um, okay, so first of all, there, there's no mathematical expression when it gets turbulent. When it's laminar, you have a nice little clean expression. It's like 64 over the Reynolds number. But when things turn turbulent, there's no known mathematical expression for turbulent flow. As we sit here right now, there's currently research going on on turbulent flow because turbulent flow is still, on, still a research area. You can, you can lay down the Navier-Stokes equations that could be, if they could be solved, would tell you the answer, but they're unsolvable so far to humans. So if you want to make a name for yourself, solve the Navier-Stokes equations for turbulent flow. You will become a very famous scientist, I promise you just because others before you couldn't do it, don't get discouraged. <laughs> Nevertheless, what happens there is we don't give up. Flow in a pipe is so important. We do something called correlations. Where's the word here? I'm looking for the word. Correlation between friction factor, Reynolds number, and roughness was developed by this, this fellow right here. A correlation means effectively a curve fit of the best data or information you have. It's effectively a word for a curve fit. So here's the curve fit. You see it's got one over the square root of F, it's under the log to the base 10, it's got this. So you see it's a very, F is a very, little F is a very complicated function of the Reynolds number based on diameter and roughness. So clearly there's no way to solve this. There's no mathematical sets, raise things to the exponent, do this, that, and you just can't, you just can't get F equals a function of Reynolds number. It's just way too complicated in this expression. So this is an example of why you might need root finding because you'd set this up as a root finding problem. You'd set, you know, bring the F of this to the other side or this, that side, and try to find the, try to find where this thing, what values of F make this thing cross zero for each and every epsilon and D. If you wanted to recreate this graph, you'd have to say, put epsilon equal to the 0.05, then do Reynolds number, did, 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 did a whole bunch to make a good plan. Then you'd have to set, epsilon to that number, repeat all the Reynolds numbers. So you'd have to perform a root finder over and over to make this plot right here. Now, it turns out that this formula is very sensitive to the initial guess. A bad initial guess can give you way off. And while many, many physical problems, you have a good idea of the first guess, like a thermal, you know, thermal problem. Uh, what's the temperature after heating something in the sun? Well, it's probably air temperature plus a few. But over here, this is an equation that when you just look at it, plus you don't really have any idea what numbers this should be. It's kind of, it's, it's really hard, I think, for me or a beginning student to say, I'll make a good guess on what F is. I mean, it's just like, I have no idea, right? So a guy came up with an approximate answer that can be used as a first guess. So this gives you kind of an, I don't know how he did it, this guy Colebrook or whatever, came up with this approximate answer. Now, when it's laminar 64 over Reynolds number. So what I'd like to do is solve this problem mathematically on, your, on our computer using MATLAB and see if we can, can't reproduce the Moody diagram. This is a great exercise in numerical computing. Also, 
as you take heat transfer, fluid mechanics and stuff, you'll be, you'll be given some homework problems or some exercises to do where you're supposed to calculate the friction factor, calculate the pressure drop, calculate the flow rate, and you have to give, you need the friction factor. So if you have this, once we, we don't have time to finish it today, I'll do it next time, but you keep this on your computer. Then when you have that and a professor, next professor assigns you a problem, you just crank up your MATLAB code, F as a function of here, and you've got it. You don't have to read this diagram. You've got a nice answer, see? And you got the Moody diagram. Um, as far as that's concerned, Moody diagram. Um, if you look up the Moody diagram on the internet, certainly you find all sorts of renditions of it, you know. I mean, here's a rendition with, oh, there's the, the Wikipedia page on it. But here's a rendition with some an 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 annotations there. But in engineering, the Moody chart so called, is a graph of non-dimensional form that relates to friction factor and Reynolds number. And here's the, the I, I like the history, I like, I like science and I like history. So I like the history of science. For instance, this, this famous diagram. In 1944, you can read about this, and I, this guy Moody plotted this thing. And you know, on my technical publications, some of them I'd be fairly proud to still pull out, some of them not so much. But you know, if I was published this paper, if I was the one to publish this paper in 1944, I'd be kind of proud of my work, you know? This is like, this is really cool, man, because 80 years later, it's still, relevant and still taught, but, but it's important, you know. Anyway, you can read the history of it. Um, I always like the history of things. And again, you can find tons of stuff on the Moody diagram if you go to the internet. Oh my God, all sorts of various versions of it. Things like that, you know, what, what different annotations. I wonder what, I looked up Moody's paper, the original paper one time, and it's got the stuff in it. Anyway, anywho, We'll go back here. So what I'd like to do as a class exercise, obviously next period, is to see if we can, we can make a little function that computes the friction factor as a function of Reynolds number and surface roughness. And then we could then see if we can use that function to create, recreate our own Moody diagram, as you saw many things on the internet there. But once you have a function, you can do it for different cases and make your plot. So, but I think it's, it's, not only is this an important example, but it's got a lot of good programming in it. It's got a numerical solution of nonlinear, really hard, a really hard nonlinear algebra with a decent first guess. It's got, if it's laminar, if it's turbulent, it's got the different rental, it's got the different roughnesses, the different conditions. And so not only is it a good exercise to learn how to calculate the friction factor for a single F, but how do you program a computer, how do you can program MATLAB to create a graph like this, where you have several cases with several values of parameters? Whether this is the Moody diagram or not, I think many students would maybe find it difficult, even if I gave you friction factor equals Reynolds and, and, and roughness, there's the, there's the equation, make this plot. I think even that part of the task would be um, challenging for many of the students. So uh, I think the whole exercise from start to finish is fun. And I guess we're about out of time now, but so Wednesday, Wednesday's class, I'm going to just jump right into this thing. Okay, so get ready. All right.